All right, so we are in the middle of this series through the Minor Prophets, and the Minor Prophets are the last 12 books of the Old Testament, starting with the book of Hosea, ending with Malachi. And uh, we come to the book of Obadiah this morning. So this is actually the shortest of the Minor Prophets. In fact, it's the shortest book in the Old Testament. Um, And so you could think, man, Old Testament... Minor prophets, you know, if I had the choice between the minor leagues and the major major leagues, like, why wouldn't I watch the major league game? Uh, But the point of saying that they're the minor prophets does not mean, I've mentioned this in previous weeks, but it's not that they're less important. It just means they're shorter. So all the minor prophets are shorter than the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And don't get thrown off that Daniel has 12 chapters and Hosea and Zechariah have 14. Word count, Daniel's way longer, okay? So just, anyway, it holds true for all of them. So it's just that they're shorter. So this book of Obadiah can be pretty obscure. We can read through it and go, huh? Like, what is going on here? It's it's all about judgment on Edom. (laughs) Like, what? What? But actually, I think it's really fitting that we sang the song, Is He Worthy? And I was listening to a podcast this week where, uh, tied with Westminster Seminary, and they were interviewing Rachel Denhollander, the gymnast, the girl that was instrumental in bringing Larry Nassar to justice. And the interviewer said, you have this beautiful combination of justice and forgiveness, the gospel, mercy. How, how do those things reconcile? How do you put those together? And I thought it was really insightful. She pointed to Revelation 5. And in Revelation 5, it says, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? Who can execute the will, the redemptive plan of God. How can this even happen? How can God be both just and merciful? Nobody can do it. And so John starts to weep until the lion of Judah shows up. But then when he turns to look, the lion is a lamb that was slain. So God is like a lion He is unswerving in his justice. Nobody's getting away with anything in this universe, which is, it ought to terrify all of us because we're all unworthy. We're all sinners. It's not just like, so if you pull up those lyrics from the song, like Tyler, I I won't rely on my memory. I I probably botch it. So um, do you feel the world is broken? Yeah, we do, don't we? We know it is. Keep going. The shadows deepen. We feel it. Yep. Keep going. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? So it's not just brokenness out there, though. It's brokenness in here, too. I'm broken. It's not just injustice out there. I'm also, I've perpetrated injustice. So how, how, do, how do you get justice and mercy together? so that we can have hope of something other than judgment. Well, it's only because of the lion of Judah who is also the lamb that was slain to pay for our sin and our injustice. And he is making all things new now and he one day will return and set the world to rights and make everything new. So actually, as much as on the first glance, Obadiah might just seem like light years apart from where we live, it maps right in to these impulses, these concerns, the stuff that we're singing about. The world is broken. Is there any hope? Like, where do we find it? So keep those things in mind as we dive into this book and be patient because the connections may not, you know, be immediate, like if you're reading the Gospels or one of the letters of Paul, but hopefully by the end you'll see how it all maps in together. So go ahead and turn there if you're not there already. Book of Obadiah. If you need help finding it, go to the end of the Old Testament and work backwards. 
but it's only probably two pages in your Bible, so it's easy to miss. All right, so we've got an outline that, you know, if you've got a device on you, you can pull up the notes from the live stream page, um, or the slides will kind of tip you off to one point after the other. So first off, we're just going to give a little intro to the book so that we have some orientation, a little bit of... Um, Get our, get our bearings, like where are we, what's going on. So we don't actually know much about Obadiah. We do know that his, what his name means, means servant of Yahweh, servant of God. So there are about a dozen Obadiahs in the Bible, and it's, it's possible that this Obadiah is not one of those other 12. Um, there is an Obadiah that was an official over Ahab's household in 1 Kings 18, Um, That's back in the 9th century B.C. He was a contemporary of Elijah. Do you remember there was this prophet who hid like a hundred prophets and fed them, hid them in caves because King Ahab's wicked wife Jezebel was on a tear and was killing the true prophets of the Lord. So some think that this Obadiah is that Obadiah, okay, which would give this book a very early dating. Um, But seems more likely that this book was written after the destruction of Jerusalem, okay, in 586 B.C. So in that sense, it would be much later, and if that's the case, we don't know much about this guy, Obadiah. But either way, the message of the book is fairly clear. It's a book of prophetic poems of judgment, divine judgment against Edom. So if you look at verse 1 of, well, there's only one chapter, so (laughs) um, the vision of Obadiah Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. Okay, so there you go. How relevant and practical does that sound? Great, we get to spend the morning talking about some place and people I've never even heard of. What does that have to do with anything? Well, hold on. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable, so let's dig in in pursuit of some of that profit. So um, Edomites, who are those people? They sat on the southeastern edge. So you've got like the Mediterranean here. You've got Judah, the southern kingdom, Israel, northern kingdom. Then you've got the Red Sea down here. So Edom is down on the southeastern corner of the Dead Sea. And they actually shared ancestry with the Israelites. So back in Genesis 25, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, was pregnant with twins, twin boys. And they're struggling in her womb, and she's wondering what in the world is happening. So she goes and asks the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Genesis 25, 23, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. So she gave birth, if you're familiar with the Bible storyline, gave birth to Jacob and Esau, right? Later on, In his life, Jacob, after his wrestling match with the Lord, one night, the Lord renames him Israel, and he becomes the father of the Israelites, the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Esau comes out with red skin, and he became the father of the Edomites. So Edom, the word Edom in Hebrew, sounds like the Hebrew word for red. Okay, so if you're, again, at all familiar with the story, you know that these two brothers were Enemies, Jacob schemed against Esau to obtain his birthright first and then deceitfully stole his blessing from their dying father. And sadly, that kind of troubled relationship continued through history. So, for instance, Numbers 20. When Israel was delivered from the promise or delivered out of Egypt, and they're on their way to the promised land, right? They want to pass through the land that Edom, the Edomites, occupied. And the Edomites said, no way. So look at Numbers chapter 20, verses 14 to 21. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother. See, we're relatives. We're family. Thus says your brother Israel. You know all the hardship that we've met. How our fathers went down to Egypt, and we lived in Egypt a long time. And the Egyptians dealt harshly with us and our fathers. And when we cried to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us up out of Egypt. And here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard or drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway, which is like a main road that went through that. 
We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we've passed through your territory. But Edom said to him, You shall not pass through, lest I come out with the sword against you. And the people of Israel said to him, We will go up by the highway, and if we drink of your water, I and my livestock, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. But he said, You shall not pass through. And Edom came out against them with a large army and with a strong force. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. So there's no love lost between these two brothers and the nations that they birthed. In, King's, in King David's day, he conquered and subdued the Edomites. You can see that in 2 Samuel 8. About 150 years later, they revolted against Judah's control and kind of got their freedom. And sadly, as we'll see, they never let go of that grudge. Okay, so there was no love lost. And it's clear that the Edomites in this book, as we go through it, they are God's enemies. So what are the characteristics of God's enemies? Because hopefully we all in this room, or if you're tuning into the live stream, you want to avoid being in that category, don't you? Anybody here want to be an enemy of God? Well, the first characteristic is pride. God opposes the proud. Okay, so look at Obadiah verses 1 to 9. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We've heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you have been destroyed. Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasures sought out. That could be a little confusing. The whole point is, if you had grape gatherers come through, they would leave some gleanings. When God comes through, he's going to totally decimate them. So in other words, it's going to be worse. This is judgment that is being laid down against them. Verse 7, all your allies have driven you to, the bo to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. So they're getting double-crossed here. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. It's interesting. Actually, the Edomites were known for their wisdom. In Jeremiah 49, it says, Is wisdom no more in Timon? Has counsel perished from the prudent? Has their wisdom vanished? So they were known for their wisdom, for their sages and all of this. And God is saying, you have no understanding. And I'm going to just remove all the wisdom from you. Your wisdom's not going to save you. Verse 8, will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau? And your mighty men, so you can trust in your wisdom, it's not going to save you. You can trust in your strength, not going to save you. By your mighty men, your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Timon, which is just a city in Edom, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. So you see their pride, their self-exaltation, and actually the geography of where they lived was indicative of their attitude. They actually lived up in the clefts of the rock, like, you know, you'd think it'd be impregnable. They would be invincible because they've got the high ground and people can't overtake them. So they actually thought that they were safe. So their attitude, in a sense, was falsely fed by their geography. They thought they were invincible. But nobody's invincible if God is your enemy. God can and will bring down the 
proud because God opposes the proud. God is an enemy to the proud because the proud are enemies to God. So our expression, pride comes before the fall, that's a biblical expression. It comes from Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We're back in Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. So the Bible makes it clear God opposes the proud. See it in James 4, 1 Peter 5, elsewhere. So you and me, we, we might not be, we're not, some prideful nation living up in the rocky hills on the southeastern corner of the Dead Sea. But this is a warning to more than just the ancient Edomites. This is a cautionary tale to all nations and all people. So um, Counselor David Palson wrote many years ago, this sentence has stuck with me ever since, and I've returned to it again and again. He said, Beware the defining characteristics of evildoers are always the remnant tendencies and temptations of those who believe. So the Edomites were just flat out proud and wicked. And we could go, oh, um, that's not me, and just write it off, you know? But we should be warned because the defining characteristics of evildoers are always the remnant tendencies and temptations of those of us who believe. So we as Christians have got to make war with pride or we will end up making war against God and others because of our pride. We've got to make war with pride or we will end up making war, rebelling against, resisting God, and will make war with others because of our pride. So over and over again, the Bible both warns us and encourages us. God opposes the proud. You don't want to pick that fight. But he gives grace to the humble. So we have no right to be proud. We have no reason to be proud. We are creatures. Everything that we have is from him. There's no good in pride. It doesn't do us any good. And have you ever noticed this? Pride has been called the big-bellied sin, like a pregnant sin. It gives birth to many other sins. For instance, lust. Do you know there's pr pride in lust? Because you think you have the right to something to consume for your own selfish pleasure something that does not belong to you. You think too highly of yourself. Pride gives birth to covetousness and jealousy because you believe you deserve better than you have. I mean, if so-and-so has this or that that you want, you're like, well, I'm at least as good as that person and they've got that, so why don't I have that? I'm better than them. I'm at least as good as them. Or how about self-pity? Have you ever noticed that self-pity is wounded pride? I deserve better. Why? I deserve better. It can look humble, but it's actually wounded pride. Grumbling and ingratitude is also, again, pride is this big-bellied sin. It just gives birth to all kinds of ugly kids. <laughs> Sorry, just going with the metaphor there. Um, grumbling and ingratitude. If you feel you deserve everything that you have, of course I do, you're not going to be grateful. And if you think that you deserve better than what you have, better than what you've been given, then you'll grumble and complain because you think you deserve more. Or how about a judgmental attitude? Isn't that born of thinking too highly of ourselves? We look down on others and we judge and dismiss and despise them. Like maybe in our days right now, particularly relevant regarding how other people handle the coronavirus stuff. Like, on the one hand, you got some people that are just like, this is ridiculous. These guidelines are nuts. Can't believe how so-and-so so is overreacting, and they're just slaves of unwarranted fear, and blah, 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 blah. 
Or, on the other hand, you can have people can't believe how careless they are. They don't care about health and safety. I can't believe that they did that. We can look down on others and judge them. Slander, gossip, those are also closely related here because if you tear other people down, you build yourself up. We just need to be careful. We need to make war with pride. We could go on and on with the progeny, the sinful offspring of pride. But let's just stop here. This isn't a history lesson. This is the mirror of the Word of God. And so let's pray, search me, O God. Don't think about how so-and-so is prideful and needs to hear about this. What about me? What about you? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Like, just take a minute and ask the Lord to expose what he needs to show you, the pride in your life, so you can repent. So God's enemies, who are they? They're the proud, verses 1 to 9. And guess what? Satan is the original proud one, right? It was his downfall, and he'd like to take as many of us down with him as he can. I mean, there's enough pride in this world, isn't there? We don't need to add to it. (laughs) People of God should not be adding to the pride, the sum total of pride in the world. We need to make war with it. How do we do that? How do we make war with pride? Well, only way we can change is by the power of the gospel in the first place to go from an enemy to a friend of God. It's the only way we can be reconciled to him. And also, it's the only way that we change as Christians. So think about the beautiful, ironic, surprising way and wisdom of God. So God is the most exalted being in the universe. Transcendent, perfect, holy, awesome, glorious, but what is he like? He's not proud. (laughs) He delights to stoop and give grace to the humble. The most beautiful, clear evidence of that is the Son of God humbling himself taking on flesh, like you or me becoming like an, like a, I don't know, like an earthworm is just a little pale comparison of the kind of condescension that God willingly took on to take on flesh and blood so that we could be reconciled. So though he was in the form of God, Philippians 2, equal with God, he didn't count that equality with God, a thing to be held on for his own advantage. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. God took on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself, humbled himself willingly by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Willingly took on that shame for us. So we are proud people by nature. We are sinful and rebellious. And God loved his proud enemies by humbly becoming one of us and dying for us. He could have just crushed us for our pride. But he was crushed for us. So if you aren't a Christian yet, Like if you are watching or you came in here this morning and you're not a Christian, you can become a Christian. You recognize, I deserve the judgment of God. I am proud. I have oftentimes like shaken my fist in his face like, you don't even know what you're doing. I'd be a better God than you. I need to repent of that and trust in the work of Christ in our place on our behalf to pay for all that pride, all that sin, all that ugliness. 
pardon of us of all of our sin, all of our guilt, reconcile us to himself and make us not enemies anymore, but friends and family, his beloved sons and daughters. And when you know that's true, all of a sudden you know who you are. You don't have to pose anymore. You don't have to put up a front. You don't have to impress everybody. You don't have to have this facade. You can be real and you can be humble. You don't have anything to prove anymore. And you have all you need because you've got God. So you know who you are. You don't have to tear others down to build yourself up. You're already a beloved son or daughter. You are literally royalty. You're an heir of the emperor of the universe. So you can have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, this humble mind of considering others more important than ourselves. So we can make war with pride by the power of the gospel, what Jesus has done for us. So listen, over and over again in the Bible, there is like warning against pride and there is promise for humility. So as we make war with pride, just let some of these verses wash over your soul and wash away the pride and the haughtiness and encourage and cultivate humility. So just listen to these verses, these promises. Just a few of them here. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also I dwell with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. He wants to lift us up. Or Isaiah 66, 1 to 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is just my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? I don't need you to build me a temple. I don't dwell in temples made by hands. All these things my hands have made. That's why everything has come to be. But this is the one to whom I will look. He was humble. I will look to him with my gracious gaze and give him grace. He was humble and contrite and trembles at my word. Or James 4. Again, I've quoted it. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And then verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Or the passage that Todd read. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Do you know that prayerlessness is pride? Because <laughs> we, we try to carry all the burden on our own shoulders. So part of the way that you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God is casting your cares on him. So enemies of God are proud. First section of Obadiah. The enemies of God also are the enemies of his people. So point number three, God opposes those who oppose his people. Verses 10 to 14. So remember, he's going to destroy and bring them down. Why? Because, verse 10, of the violence done to your brother Jacob. Shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, your brother's wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them, like the foreigners, like the people that came in to attack. But do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. So what in the world is going on here? In 586, the Babylonians came in 
and destroyed and sacked and burned Jerusalem, which is in Judah, which is the southern part of the Israelites, the brother of the Edomites. And so the the Babylonians attacked, they destroyed um, Jerusalem. That was God's judgment. But what was the right response on Edom's part? They should have lamented and had compassion. Instead, they stood aloof, like smirking and smiling, like, yeah. They were gloating, and they're looting. It was like opportunism. It's wicked and wrong. So when Judah was conquered, they came in, and they were happy about it. Psalm 137, 7 says this, Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, Lay it bare. Lay it bare to the foundations. So they were cheering on the enemies of God to destroy Jerusalem. We read already in Amos, verse, chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Edom and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity, and his anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. So I will fire, send a fire upon Timon, and it shall de- devour the strongholds of Basra. Again, just two cities of Edom. So listen, this is not a myth. This is not a fairy tale. This really happened. This was a real attack by the Babylonians. This was a real invasion. People were really dying. People, the city was burning, being destroyed and plundered. People are running for their lives, terrified and screaming. And those people would have known the area better than the Babylonian invaders. They would have known the local roads are trying to find ways out. Imagine being one of these fleeing mothers with a child in arms. And just when you thought you'd gotten away, who, who meets you at the crossroads? Some Edomites. Your relatives. And what do they do? Rather than like, hey, like, why don't you hide here? They're waiting in ambush. They were actually looking to ingratiate themselves to the Babylonians. Like, here you go. We found some more. We want to be on the side of the winners here. Make sure we saddle up next to them and get on their good side. That's what they did to their cousins. They were like vultures circling. So imagine yourself in like a third world context. And imagine you have a store and there's no insurance as a safety net in the face of disaster. And imagine a hurricane comes through, rips your store open, and your store is looted. Okay? And then you find out that the perpetrators were your cousins. Like, what? They should have come to the aid of their relatives. Instead, they sided with the Babylonians. So Edom even went to neighboring satellite cities and captured and even killed Israelites. So they took advantage like opportunists. They were plundering. So note now in verse 15, there's an important shift that we've got to notice. Verse 15, for the day of the, of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. So do you see the shift there? It goes from just focusing on Edom to focusing on all the nations. So Edom's pride and their fall that's coming, that God's going to bring on them, is an image, a small-scale image of the pride and fall that is the future of every nation that's an enemy of God. So Edom's like a scale model. It's like an example of all mankind. In fact, Edom in Hebrew has the exact same consonants as Adam, Edom, Adam. In Hebrew. So there's almost maybe even a play on words there. As Edom goes, so will all mankind go, that is the enemy of God. God's justice will oppose pride and violence of all nations on the day of the Lord. So God opposes the proud, and God opposes those who oppose his people. God is an enemy to the enemies of his people, and he will judge them. So when you mess with the people of God, you mess with God. Remember Acts 9? Saul 
is breathing out threats and murder to the disciples of Jesus. He's going after them to imprison them, to have them killed. He's standing there when Stephen was stoned to death. And then what happened on the road to Damascus? The Lord Jesus confronted him, blinded him, stopped him in his tracks, and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? If you mess with my people, you are messing with me. So now we can begin to see why God would include a book in the canon that was aimed at the Edomites. Because it's weird. It's like, well, the whole book is aimed at the Edomites. What does that have to do with me? It seems irrelevant. No, it was a comfort and an encouragement to the people of God. So those proud enemies of God were not going to get away with their cruelty. God's going to bring them down, bring them to justice. In fact, history shows that the Nabataean Arabs conquered Edom by 312 B.C., never to be rebuilt again, took over their capital in 312 B.C. So notice the nature of the justice that God brings. He's going to turn their deeds back on their own head. Look at Obadiah 15 again, 15 and 16. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. It's like the flip side of love your neighbor as yourself. If you're cruel, God will cruelly judge you. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain at the expense of my people, plundering and, you know, drinking as a result of their suffering, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been. So this is like poetic justice. This is retributive justice. As you have drunk, so all the nations shall drink. So they drank in victory, but they will drink again, and this is not the drink of victory. They're going to drink the cup of God's wrath. And it's not just Edom that this will happen to. It's all the nations that are prideful like Edom. All the nations that mistreat God's people. So if you were living in North Korea as a Christian, would the book of Obadiah be encouraging to you? Like you might be barely hanging on in some constant like labor camp. And it's like, Lord, where are you? Like, have you forgotten about us? Do you love us? Do you care about us? Read the book of Obadiah. It could seem like light years away from us. But how encouraging to know that they are not going to get away with this forever. God is going to judge the enemies of his people. So finally, not only judgment is here, <clears throat> but this is a source of comfort and hope for God's people. Okay, point number four, last point. God gives hope to his humble people. Verses 17 to 21. So, Verses 15 and 16 is the judgment on all the enemies of God. But, verse 17, in Mount Zion, which is like another way to talk about Jerusalem, but it can also mean just the city of God, the people of God. In Mount Zion, there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. Nobody can take them away anymore. The house of Jacob shall be a fire. The house of Joseph, a flame. The house of Esau, again, the enemy of God, stubble. How does stubble do in the face of fire and flame? Not so well. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau, for the enemies of God, for the Lord has spoken. Those of the Negev shall possess Mount Esau. And those of the Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria. And Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath. And the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad shall possess the cities of the Negev. What in the world is that all about? It's simple. It's confusing until you know that this is the full extent of the promised land being returned to the people of God. 
So do you see how over time, because of their sin and because of enemies, you know, parts of the promised land and there's a divided kingdom and all this stuff is going on? But one day, God's going to <clears throat> set everything to rights. And the fullness of this fulfillment is in the new creation, new heavens and new earth, where there's not going to be any more enemies. There's not going to be any more night. There's no lock on the gate. Gates are always open because there's no more enemies. There's no more death. There's no more fear or anything. No more crying or pain anymore. Because the whole earth is the promised land. There's no darkness. There's no scary, threatening place anymore. It's all gone. All the enemies have been dealt with and destroyed. And God's people are safe and secure forever. And we will flourish forever with him. So this is a source of comfort and hope to the people of God. So condemnation on the, the proud Edoms of the world, but for Judah, for the people of God, it's comforting. There's hope for the humble, for God's people, those who humbly trust and follow Jesus. Guess what? We're going to be on the right side of history. No matter how crazy upside down and backwards our country gets or our world gets, if you were with Jesus, you were on the right side of history in the broadest sense. The reversal is coming, and he will exalt us forever. We will reign with him. So Revelation eleven fifteen is coming. Look at verse 21 of, of Obadiah, last verse. Saviors, okay, that's used of leaders and judges in the book of Judges. <clears throat> leaders shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau. So the people of God will rule this enemy kingdom because the kingdom shall be the Lord's. The Lord's kingdom will rule over every kingdom, right? So Revelation eleven fifteen. then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign from sea to shining sea. That's, that's just America. He shall reign over every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And he shall reign forever and ever. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that this is our future and this is our hope. No matter how hard this life is, no matter how hard the enemies of God may press against us or how much like a wilderness this world may seem, we thank you for the blessed hope of the new creation, the return of Christ, when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. You have done great things. You are doing great things. You will do great things. And we will feast and weep no more. So, Lord, encourage us where we need to be humbled, where we need to see our pride and make war with it. Expose that by your Spirit and help us to turn from it and follow Jesus in the humble footsteps of our humble Savior. And help us to cultivate humility. Help us to love your people, not be enemy-like toward them. And help us to walk forward with the comfort and the hope that comes from all these blessed promises. We thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.